Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, May 29th, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Our handlers have been quite busy over the long weekend, so we have a number of diaries to talk about. First of all, Kevin talked about the use of ultrasound in order to either locate mobile devices. So that's, for example, used by stores in order to detect customers and the like. And secondly, also to use it for chat applications or data exfiltration. So he has a number of links here for various applications applications that either tell you how to, for example, jam these locator applications or how to use it, for example, in a simple instant messenger application. And Didier took a look at some malware that took advantage of the Nullsoft scriptable install system or NSIS. Now, this particular system isn't just used for malware, actually, a lot of normal software uses it as well, and it simplifies the creation of installers. Now, one interesting observation here from DDA is these NSIS installers, they come with an install script, and turns out an old version of 7-zip is able to actually tell you what's in that install script. It essentially decomposes compiles it. Only caveat here, you have to download this old version which has its own problems, speak of vulnerabilities. And Xavier took a look at how some word macros make it past some common antivirus systems. Now, this of course has always been happening where you open a word document that supposedly wasn't malicious based on a number of different antivirus scans, but then like in this case, it turns out to be pretty obviously malicious in how it tries to trick you into enabling macros. Now, the problem here, of course, is that small changes to patterns within the macro allow them to sneak past signature-based detection methods. And now, a lot of antivirus also enables behavioral detection methods. So once you're actually loading and starting the macro, it may be blocked, but of course, when you are, for example, inspecting attachments on a mail server or on an HTTP proxy, then you'll have a hard time figuring out if something is malicious or not, and then you rely again on the end user's workstation to be configured correctly. And security company Pentest Partners made the news with a new attack against C-Wave. Now, this particular attack does target the S2 protocol, which is typically used for security relevant devices like door locks and does promise some better encryption than your default C-Wave equipment. Now, the one caveat with this attack that makes it probably less of an issue than it sounds is that in order to execute the attack, the attacker has to be in RF range during the time at which you pair the device. So there's only a fairly short time frame in which the attacker would be able to launch the attack. Pentest partners suggest that an attacker may be able to leave like a battery powered device uh, close to the fence of a facility and then will be able to just wait for the pairing to happen at some point. And at that point, the attack will then be conducted automatically. I'll link to both blog posts in the show notes so you can make up your own mind. Personally, I have to admit, I like these C-Wave locks for their convenience at home. I wouldn't use them for a high security facility for a normal home where an attacker could also just uh, smash a window. They probably don't really decrease your security substantially. The only possible problem you may have here is that someone could enter your house undetected. If that's your concern, then you probably should stick to some real high-end mechanics mechanical locks. A lot of the cheaper, more common mechanical locks, of course, can be picked. And that's usually not easily detectable either. 
And then we have yet a new bug in the Electron framework. And now this is actually not quite a new bug, but really a bypass for a fix from earlier this year. If you remember in January, there was a huge gap in the Electron framework that allowed people to execute arbitrary code via protocol handlers. All you had to do is load essentially a script with the right protocol designator, and then an application could be launched. Launched. Well, Electron fixed the problem, but didn't fix it completely. The new vulnerability uses host rules. Host rules do allow an attacker to essentially specify how URLs are being rewritten. So in essence, a URL that makes it past the filter that was implemented in January can then be rewritten to again execute arbitrary code. A patch was released and it does seem to work at this point. Now, of course, one option would be to disable uh, this host rules feature, but this may break existing applications. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.